I'm thrilled to share a message with you today that could potentially alter your future, beginning right now. Have you ever set a goal for yourself, poured in all your effort and hard work, only to find that the results you hoped for still elude you? You're not alone. It's a common struggle faced by many of us on our journey toward success. But fear not, because in today's message, I'll outline the five reasons why you might not be seeing the results you desire from your efforts to achieve your goals. And let me tell you, these reasons may surprise you. By the end of this discussion, you'll have a clear understanding of what might be holding you back and how to turn things around. So, if you're feeling frustrated, discouraged, or just plain stuck, then this message is for you. It's time to take control of your goals and start seeing the results you deserve. So, sit back, relax, and get ready to learn the five reasons why you're not seeing results from your efforts to achieve your goals. Let's dive in. Let's begin with reason number five. Let me ask you this. How many of you have set goals for yourself, whether in your career, relationships, health, or personal growth? I'm sure most of you have your hands raised, and that's fantastic. Setting goals is the initial step toward achieving success and living a fulfilling life. But here's the thing, my friends. Setting goals is not enough. You need to take consistent action towards those goals to see results. And that's where most people struggle. They set their goals, put in some effort initially, but when they don't see immediate results, they give up. They start doubting themselves and their abilities, and eventually, they abandon their goals altogether. So, why does this happen? Why do so many people fail to achieve their goals? The answer lies in unrealistic expectations. We live in a society where we want everything instantly. Fast food, fast internet, and fast results. But the truth is, success takes time and effort. There are no shortcuts to success. We see successful people, and we want to be like them. But what we don't see is the years of hard work, dedication, and perseverance that they've put in to get where they are. We want to achieve our goals overnight, without putting in the necessary time and effort. And when we don't see immediate results, we get discouraged and give up. But my friends, let me tell you this. Success is not a destination. It is a journey. And every journey takes time. It takes time to build a successful career, a strong and loving relationship, optimal health, and personal development. We need to have realistic expectations when it comes to our goals. We need to understand that success is not a straight line. There will be ups and downs, setbacks and challenges. But it is how we handle those obstacles that will determine our success. We also need to understand that success looks different for everyone. Your definition of success may be different from mine, and that's okay. We all have our own unique paths and journeys. What matters is that we are making progress toward our goals, no matter how small it may seem. Another reason why you might not be seeing results is because you're not willing to put in the necessary effort. We live in a world of instant gratification, where we want everything to come easy. But the truth is, anything worth having requires hard work and determination. You cannot expect to achieve your goals by putting in half-hearted effort. You need to be fully committed and willing to do whatever it takes to make your dreams a reality. As the saying goes, the only place where success comes before work is in the dictionary. We also need to be mindful of our thoughts and beliefs. Our thoughts have a powerful impact on our actions and ultimately our results. If you have a negative mindset and constantly doubt yourself, you will not see the results you desire. You need to believe in yourself and your abilities. You need to have a positive mindset and trust in the process. Lastly, we need to be patient. Rome wasn't built in a day, and neither will your goals be achieved overnight. We need to trust in the process and be patient with ourselves. Success takes time, and it is important to enjoy the journey and celebrate our small wins along the way. Now let's move on to reason number four. Setting goals and working towards them is a crucial aspect of personal development. It is what drives us to become better versions of ourselves and achieve our dreams. But what good is it to have goals if we are not tracking our progress towards them? How can we know if we are making any headway, or if we are simply spinning our wheels? Let me give you an example. Imagine you are planning a road trip from New York to Los Angeles. You have a map, GPS, and a full tank of gas. But here's the catch. You have no idea how far you've traveled or how much further you have to go. How confident would you be about reaching your destination? Not very, right? The same principle applies to our goals. We may have a clear idea of where we want to go. But without tracking our progress, we are simply wandering aimlessly. So why do so many of us fail to track our progress? 
One reason could be that we are afraid of facing the truth. It is much easier to ignore our lack of progress than to confront it. We may feel discouraged or disappointed if we see that we are not making as much progress as we had hoped. But here's the thing. Progress, no matter how small, is still progress. And it is only by acknowledging where we are that we can make the necessary changes to get to where we want to be. Another reason for not tracking progress is that we may not know how to do it effectively. We may set vague or unrealistic goals, making it difficult to measure our progress. For example, saying I want to be healthier is a great goal, but how do we measure it? Instead, we can set specific and measurable goals, such as, I want to lose 10 OBs in 3 months, or, I want to run a 5K in 6 months. This not only gives us a clear target to aim for, but also allows us to track our progress along the way. Some of you may be thinking, but Jim, I don't have the time to track my progress, I'm too busy working towards my goals. And to that, I say tracking progress doesn't have to be a time-consuming task. It can be as simple as jotting down a few notes each day or week about what you have accomplished towards your goal. You can also use tools such as apps or spreadsheets to help you track your progress. The key is to find a method that works for you and stick to it. Not tracking progress can also lead to a lack of motivation. We may start off strong, but as time goes on and we don't see any tangible results, we may lose our drive and give up on our goals altogether. But if we are tracking our progress, we can see how far we've come and be motivated to keep going, even if we are not where we want to be yet. We can see that we are making progress, and that our efforts are not in vain. Furthermore, tracking progress allows us to identify any roadblocks or obstacles that may be hindering our progress. It gives us the opportunity to reassess our strategies and make necessary adjustments. As the saying goes, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. By tracking our progress, we can see what is working and what isn't and make changes accordingly. In addition to helping us reach our goals, progress also allows us to celebrate our successes. It is important to acknowledge and celebrate our achievements, no matter how small they may seem. This not only boosts our confidence and motivation, but also reminds us of why we started on this journey in the first place. Now let's talk about reason number three. I know that many of you have big dreams and aspirations. You have set goals for yourself and have put in a lot of effort to achieve them. But for some reason, you're just not seeing the results you want. Well, let me tell you my friend, you are not alone. This is a common problem that many people face. And the main reason for this is a lack of consistency. You see, consistency is the key to success in anything that you do. It is the glue that holds everything together. Without consistency, your efforts will go to waste. You may have all the talent, all the skills, and all the resources, but if you're not consistent, you will never reach your full potential. So, why is it that we struggle with consistency? Why is it so hard for us to stay on track and keep pushing towards our goals? Well, there are a few reasons for this, and I want to address them today so that you can start to see the results you desire. The first reason is that we often lack clarity. You see, when we set goals, we need to be very clear about what we want to achieve. We need to have a clear picture in our minds of what our end goal looks like. Without this clarity, it's easy to get off track and lose focus. So, if you're struggling with consistency, ask yourself, am I clear about what I want to achieve? If the answer is no, then it's time to sit down and get clear on your goals. The second reason is that we often underestimate the power of small, consistent actions. We live in a society where we want everything now. We want instant gratification. But the truth is, success doesn't happen overnight. It takes small, consistent actions every single day to achieve our goals. And this is where many people fail. They take big, massive action in the beginning, but then they burn out and lose momentum. Consistency is about taking small, consistent actions every day towards your goals. It's about showing up, even when you don't feel like it. It's about doing the work, even when it's hard. Remember, small, consistent actions lead to big results. The third reason is that we often let our emotions control us. We all have days when we don't feel motivated or inspired, but it's on those days that we need to push through and stay consistent. You see, motivation and inspiration are great, but they are not reliable. They come and go. But discipline and consistency are what will keep you going, even when you don't feel like it. So, don't let your emotions control you. Instead, focus on building discipline and consistency in your life. The fourth reason is that we often compare ourselves to others. In today's world of social media, it's easy to fall into the trap of comparing ourselves to others. 
We see people's highlight reels, and we start to feel like we're not doing enough. But the truth is, everyone's journey is different. We all have different starting points, different struggles, and different paths. So, instead of comparing yourself to others, focus on your own journey. Stay consistent with your own goals, and trust that your efforts will pay off in the end. The fifth reason is that we often have a fear of failure. Many of us are afraid to fail, and this fear can hold us back from being consistent. We worry about what others will think if we fail, or we worry that we're not good enough. But here's the thing. Failure is not the opposite of success. It's part of success. Every successful person has failed at some point in their journey. The key is to learn from your failures and keep moving forward. Don't let the fear of failure hold you back from being consistent. But let me tell you, failure is a part of the journey. It's how we learn and grow, though don't let the fear of failure stop you from being consistent. Embrace failure as a learning opportunity and keep pushing forward. The final reason is that we often lack accountability. When we set goals for ourselves, it's easy to make excuses and let ourselves off the hook. But when we have someone holding us accountable, we are more likely to stay consistent. This could be a friend, a coach, or a mentor. Find someone who can hold you accountable and keep you on track towards your goals. Now, on to number two. T. We all put in the effort. We work hard, we make sacrifices, but somehow we still fall short of our goals. And the reason for this is simple. We lack a proper plan. Having a goal is not enough. It is just the starting point. Without a proper plan, your goals will remain nothing but a distant dream. You need to have a roadmap, a guide that will take you from where you are to where you want to be. And that roadmap is your plan. So why is it that so many of us fail to create and execute a proper plan? The answer is simple. We are too busy trying to make things happen instead of taking the time to plan for them. We live in a fast-paced world where we want instant results, and we want them now. But the truth is, success takes time, and it requires a proper plan. Let me share with you a story about two men who wanted to climb a mountain. The first man, let's call him John, was in a hurry. He wanted to reach the top as quickly as possible, so he started climbing without a plan. He took the steepest and most challenging route, and he pushed himself to the limit. But as he reached the halfway point, he realized that he was exhausted, and he had no idea where to go next. He had to turn back and start all over again. The second man, let's call him Tom, took a different approach. He spent weeks studying the mountain, analyzing different routes, and creating a detailed plan. He knew exactly where to go, what equipment to bring, and how much time it would take. And because of his proper plan, he reached the top of the mountain with ease and achieved his goal. Now let me ask you, who do you think was more successful, John or Tom? I am sure you all agree that it was Tom, and the reason for his success was his proper plan. So my friends, if you want to see results from your efforts to hit your goals, you need to have a proper plan. And I am not talking about a vague idea or a rough outline. I am talking about a detailed step-by-step -step plan that will guide you towards your goal. Now you might be thinking, but Jim, I don't have the time to create a proper plan. I am too busy with work, family, and other responsibilities. And my response to that is, you don't have time not to have a proper plan. You see, time is the most valuable asset we have, and if we don't use it wisely, it will slip away from us. We need to make time for the things that truly matter in our lives, and creating a proper plan for our goals is one of them. It may take some time and effort, but trust me, it will be worth it in the end. Now let me share with you some tips on how to create a proper plan for your goals. First and foremost, you need to be crystal clear about your goal. What exactly do you want to achieve? Be specific and write it down. The more specific you are, the easier it will be to create a plan. Next, break down your goal into smaller manageable tasks. This will make your goal less overwhelming and more achievable. Set deadlines for each task and hold yourself accountable. Now this is crucial. Be realistic. Don't set yourself up for failure by setting unrealistic goals and deadlines. Be honest with yourself about what you can accomplish in a given time frame. Another important aspect of a proper plan is to have a backup plan. Life is unpredictable, and things may not always go as planned. So, it is essential to have a backup plan in case things don't work out the way you anticipated. And finally, don't be afraid to seek help. You don't have to do everything on your own. Surround yourself with people who have expertise in the areas you need help with. 
seek advice, guidance, and support from those who have already achieved what you are trying to achieve. My friends, having a proper plan is the key to success. It will give you direction, keep you focused, and help you stay on track. Remember, the goal without a plan is just a wish. Now, to the one you've been waiting for. So, what is the number one reason we fail to see results despite the effort we put in to achieve our goals? Day, we all have goals and dreams that we want to achieve, whether it's losing weight, starting a business, or improving our relationships. We set these goals with the best of intentions. We put in the effort. We make the sacrifices, and yet we don't see the results we desire. And this can be incredibly discouraging. We start to doubt ourselves, our abilities, and our goals. We wonder if it's even worth it to keep trying. But I'm here to tell you that it is worth it. And the reason why you're not seeing results is not that you lack effort or determination. It's because you're not addressing the underlying issues that are holding you back. You see, we all have underlying issues that affect our ability to achieve our goals. These issues can be internal or external, but they all have one thing in common. They are roadblocks that prevent us from reaching our full potential. And until we address these issues, we will continue to struggle and fall short of our goals. So, what are these underlying issues? They can vary from person to person, but there are a few common ones that I have seen time and time again in my years of working with individuals on their personal development. Firstly, fear. Fear is a powerful emotion that can paralyze us and prevent us from taking action towards our goals. We fear failure, rejection, and even success. We let fear hold us back from taking risks and stepping out of our comfort zone. But here's the thing. Fear is just an illusion. It's a creation of our minds, and it only has power over us if we let it. So if you want to see results, you must face your fears head on. Embrace them, acknowledge them, and then push through them. Secondly, limiting beliefs. Many of us have beliefs that hold us back from reaching our full potential. These beliefs can be instilled in us from a young age by our parents, teachers, or society. They can also be a result of past failures or disappointments. These beliefs can be things like, I'm not smart enough, I'm not worthy, or I'm not capable. But here's the truth. These beliefs are not facts. They are just thoughts that we have accepted as truth. And the good news is, we have the power to change them. We must challenge these beliefs and replace them with positive, empowering ones. Thirdly, lack of clarity. Many of us set goals without truly understanding what we want or why we want it. We have a vague idea of what we want, but we haven't taken the time to define it clearly. And without clarity, it's challenging to create a plan of action and stay motivated. So if you're not seeing results, ask yourself, what do I truly want and why do I want it? Write it down, visualize it, and then create a plan to achieve it. Lastly, lack of consistency. We live in a world of instant gratification where we want results now. But the reality is, success takes time and consistent effort. Many of us give up too soon because we're not seeing immediate results. We get discouraged and lose motivation. But here's the truth. Success is not a one-time event. It's a series of small actions done consistently over time. So if you want to see results, you must commit to taking consistent action towards your goals, even when you don't see immediate results. Now I know that addressing these underlying issues is not easy. It takes courage, determination, and a willingness to change. But I can assure you, it is worth it. When you face your fears, challenge your limiting beliefs, gain clarity, and stay consistent, you will see results. And not just in your goals, but in all areas of your life. So my challenge to you today is this. Take a moment to reflect on your goals and ask yourself, what underlying issues am I not addressing? Identify them, and then commit to working on them. And I promise you, when you do, you will see a transformation in your life. In our next topic of personal development, we will dive deeper into these underlying issues and discuss strategies to overcome them. But for now, I want to leave you with this quote from Zig Ziglar. You were born to win, but to be a winner, you must plan to win, prepare to win, and expect to win. Thank you for your time, and I wish you all the best on your journey towards success. Remember, you have the power to overcome any obstacle and achieve your goals. Now go out there and make it happen. Now jot down these five key ideas. Number one, work on your personal philosophy. The first thing you start changing is your philosophy. 
You start changing your mind. You start changing how you think. You start picking up new ideas and information. Gather new knowledge. Make better decisions about what's valuable. And I'm telling you, if you'll do that, your whole life will change. Your health will change. Your relationship with your family will change. Your ability to cope with challenges and problems will change. I'm telling you, income, promotions, all of it will change if you will change. It'll all change. If you won't change, it isn't going to change. You can keep your fingers crossed if you want to and hope they'll straighten it out. You can wish for the wind not to blow quite as severe, but I'm telling you, wishing for the wind to change in your favor, we call it naive at best. Don't do this any longer. Don't wish for a better wind. The key, E, is to wish for the wisdom to set a better sail. Utilize whatever wind that blows to take you wherever you want to go. That is a philosophy I picked up at age 25, and it revolutionized my whole life. My mentor, Mr. Ron, said, You've been working six years. How are you doing? I said, Not very well. He said, I suggest you not do that anymore. He said, Couldn't we go over the last six years and find out where your errors in judgment were, and couldn't we correct those and invest that correction in the next six years? I said, I guess we could. Only humans can do this. They, if you were a tree, you'd be stuck. Right? If you used up all the nourishment around you, you couldn't move, then you would die. But that's not true. So, however little or much you want to change, that's up to you. But see if there's a class and you don't take it, and a skill and you don't learn it, and a discipline and you don't try it, and if there's a possibility, and you don't explore it, then who are we going to blame? Nobody but yourself. You know we put some of the valuable things on the high shelf so you can't get to until you qualify. If you want the things on the higher shelf, you've got to stand on the books. You read every book, you get to stand a little higher so you can get the things on the higher shelf. Become a good reader. All of the successful people I know and work with around the world, they're all good readers. Curiosity drives them to read. They've got to know. They just read, read, read. Did you know there's a book on how to be stronger, more decisive, be a speaker, be a leader, have a better effect on other people, develop your personality? Did you know there's books on that? And people don't read them. How would you explain that? And they can read. Did you know that hundreds of successful people have written their stories in books and they wrote down how they did it? And people don't read. How would you explain that? The guy is busy, I guess. You know, you get tied up. The guy says, Well, if you work where I work, by the time you struggle home, it's late. You've got to eat, buy the supper, watch the little TV, get to bed. You can't sit up half the night reading, 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 reading. And the guy's behind on his car payment. Good worker, hard worker, sincere, but you've got to be better than sincere and work hard. Otherwise, at the end of your life, you'll wind up cold, stony broke. You've got to be better than a good worker. You've got to be a good reader. Now you don't have to read or listen to educational cassettes half the night, although if you're broke, it's a good place to start. But here's all I ask, just 30 minutes a day. That's all. Stretch it to an hour if you can, but at least 30 minutes. Here, read something challenging, something instructional, at least 30 minutes a day. And here's the next key. Every day. Don't miss. Miss a meal, but not your 30 minutes. Hey, you can get along without some meal. But you can't get along without some ideas, examples, and inspiration. And also, remember to properly feed the mind, you must have good balance. Don't just read or listen to the easy stuff. You can't live on mental candy. Mr. Shack got me started on my library. When I first met him, he said to me, Become self-educated. Standard education will get you standard results. Check those numbers and see if that's what you want. And if it isn't, if you want something better than standard, you must become self-educated. Shaq recommended a couple of books in particular to get me started. Now, I had a Bible, that's 66 books, so that was a pretty good start. But the first book Mr. Shaq told me to get was the book Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. If you don't already have it, it's a great one to add to your library. I read it several dozen times. Shaq said, Repetition is the mother of skill. And if you could have seen my bank account at the time, you would have known I needed lots of that kind of repetition. Some of the ideas in that book made major changes in my life. As I look back now, the book was worth thousands, and I bought it for pennies. 
I learned a very valuable lesson there can be a great deal of difference between cost and value. Before I met Mr. Shack, I used to ask, how much does it cost? After I met him, however, I soon learned to ask, how much is it worth? I started basing my life on worth instead of cost, and everything changed. Here's the next one. Attitude. It is our attitude toward life, which will determine life's attitude toward us. Now let's talk about the attitudes of people who are successful. Successful people come in all shapes and sizes, and in widely varying degrees of intelligence, background and so on, but they all have one thing in common. They expect more good out of life than bad. They expect to succeed more than they fail. If you want something worthwhile, take the attitude that there are a lot more reasons why you can have it than there are that you cannot, and set out to earn it. Go after it. Work at it. Ask for it. And nine times out of ten, you will get it. Now let me tell you of a little test you can make which will prove beyond any shadow of a doubt that a good attitude can change a person's life as dramatically as walking from a darkened room into the bright, clear light of day. So here's the test. For the next 30 days, act toward the world, everything and everyone with whom you come in contact, with the attitude which represents the kind of results you want to achieve. That is, if the result you want is more success in what you're doing, Act as though you're already in possession of the success you seek. If you want others to treat you with admiration and respect, treat others with admiration and respect first. Have you ever stopped to think of this? Every human being on earth is the most important human being on earth as far as he or she is concerned. You may never get anyone to admit it, but it's a fact. So for the next 30 days, treat every person with whom you come in contact as the most important person on earth. Remembering as you do so, that as far as that person is concerned, he or she is. Reason I say, treat everyone in this fashion, is mainly because this is the way human beings ought to treat each other, and because it will help you form a habit that will bring you amazing and delightful results for the rest of your life. Have you ever noticed that the higher you go in any organization of value, the nicer the people seem to become? You see, the bigger the person, the easier it is to talk to him, to get along with him, to do business with him. Do you know why? It's because he's got a good attitude, and people with the best attitudes just naturally gravitate toward the top. So for 30 days, act toward others in the world at large in exactly the same manner you want the world and others to act toward you. Treat your wife or husband as the person he or she really is, the most important person in your life. The same with the children they carry out into the world each morning. For 30 days, the kind of attitude you would have if you were the most successful human being on earth, and notice how it quickly develops into a habitual attitude. When a person does this, he should realize he has already placed himself on the road to what he seeks. He is right now in the top five of the people in this or any other country. He has prepared the ground and planted the seed. He has made of himself a magnet, an embodiment of that which he seeks. Before metal can be cast into a desired shape, the mold, the expectant receptacle, must first be fashioned. Before a building can be erected, the excavation must be made, and the foundation laid. And before a person can achieve the kind of life he wants, he must become that kind of individual. He must think, act, talk, walk, and conduct himself in all of his affairs, as would the person he wishes to become. He is then actually that person, and the things that person would have and do, will naturally come to him almost immediately. The change will be noticed. Irritations that used to frustrate and annoy disappear. When some less informed individual gives you a bad time, stay on the track. When someone cuts in front of you with his car or acts in any other manner that shows his ignorance and lack of courtesy, don't permit yourself to drop to his level. Pity him, for that's what he really deserves. That's the very group a person doesn't want to belong to, and if he acts like them, well, let's face it, he belongs with them. There's nothing in the world that men, women and children want and need more than the feeling that they're important, that they're needed and respected. They will give their love, their affection, their respect, and their business to the person who feels this need. So the magic word is attitude. And in summing up a few points to keep in mind. 1. It is our attitude at the beginning of a task which, more than anything else, will affect its successful outcome. 2. We are interdependent. It is impossible to succeed without others, and it is our attitude toward others which will determine their attitude toward us. 3. 
Before a person can achieve the kind of life he wants, he must become that kind of individual. He must think, act, talk, walk, and conduct himself in all of his affairs, as would the person he wishes to become. 4. The higher you go in any organization of value, the better will be the attitudes you'll find. 5. Your mind can hold only one thought at a time, and since there's nothing at all to be gained by being negative, be positive. The deepest craving of human beings is to be needed, to feel important, to be appreciated. Give it to them, and they'll return it to you. 6. Look for the best and new ideas. As someone said, I've never met a person I couldn't learn something from. 7. Don't waste valuable time broadcasting personal problems. It probably won't help you. It cannot help others. 8. Don't talk about your health unless it's good. 9. Radiate the attitude of well-being, of confidence, of a person who knows where he's going. This will inspire those around you, and you'll find good things will begin happening to you. Now here's the third of the five ideas. Lifestyle. Because the essence of life is not a Ferrari or a bank account. It's not one million dollars. Here's the essence of life. Learning to live a good life. Don't just learn how to earn. Learn how to live. Mr. Schaff taught me lifestyle in those early days, starting with small amounts. He said, imagine that you're getting your shoes shined, and the shoe shine boy has done a fabulous job, so you pay him for the shine. Now, you consider from the change in your hand what kind of tip to give him, and the question pops into your mind. Shall I give him one quarter or two quarters for my nice shine? Mr. Ian Chaff said, if two amounts for a tip ever come to your mind, always go for the higher amount. I said, what difference would that make, one quarter or two quarters? He said, all the difference in the world. If you said, well, I'll just give him one quarter, that will affect you for the rest of the day. You will start feeling bad. Sure enough, in the middle of the day, you will look down at your great shoe shine and say, I've got to be cheap, one lousy quarter. That will affect you. However, if you go for two quarters, Schaff said, you can't believe the feeling you can buy for another quarter. That's lifestyle. So, develop your lifestyle a little more, your style of seeing, giving, sharing, enjoy. It's not the amount that counts, but the experience of individual live with style. I remember saying to Mr. Schaff one time, if I had more money, I would be happy. And he gave me some of the better words of wisdom when he said to me, Mr. R, the key to happiness is not more. Happiness is an art to be studied and practiced. He said, more money will only make you more of what you already are. If you're inclined to be unhappy, if you get a lot of money, you will be miserable. More money will only make you more. More money will only amplify. If you are inclined to be mean and you get a lot of money, you will be a terror. If you are inclined to drink a little too much, when you get a lot of money, you can now become a drunk because you can drink everything. So, style is not more. Style is an art. Here's something else to think about. Did you ever hear where the expression tip came from, as in tip the waiter, or waitress in a restaurant? Mr. Schaff taught me that it began as a symbol for the phrase, to ensure promptness. Now Schaff said, if a tip is to ensure promptness, when should you give it? Up front. See, I didn't know that. I said, no, you have lunch. And if you get good service, you leave a good tip. If you get lousy service, no tip. And he said to me, no, no, Mr. R, sophisticated people don't take a chance on good service. They ensure good service by giving the money up front. I said, wow, what a way to live. I had never thought of that. So, the next time you have someone special to take to lunch, call the waitress over, arm around the shoulders and say, here's five dollars. Would you take good care of me and my friend? Schaff said, you won't believe what happens. They do what's known as hover. They hover around your table. Same money, different style. The next one is activity. Now here's an important question. What is your philosophy about activity? What about hard work, long hours, full days? If you're doing something, how hard should you go at it? How much time should you put in? Everybody has to develop their philosophy about activity, because your philosophy of activity will affect the rest of your life. Not to think so is naive. I've got a good clue on rest. Make rest a necessity, not an objective. If you rest too long, the weeds take the garden in the summer. So you can't rest too long. Life doesn't stand still, 
and the threats of life will start overwhelming the values of life if you just let it go. So, we've all got to have a philosophy about activity. Let me give you one of the best I know. Here's what it says. An ancient phrase says, Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. That's a philosophy. You say, well, I'm getting by with half my might. Well, okay, but you've got to decide on your own personal philosophy of activity. Now this philosophy says, do it with all your might. You think there's any value or virtue in that? Well, I don't know. You've got to decide. You've got to weigh this out. You've got to evaluate it for yourself and put it on your own mental scales. And you've got to come up with your own answers. How hard should you work? I'm teaching kids now the ant philosophy. An ancient story says, everybody should study ants, especially lazy people. The ant philosophy, let me give it to you. It's very, very brief. Ants never quit. Good philosophy. If they're headed somewhere and you try to stop them, they'll look for another way. They'll climb over. They'll climb under. They'll climb around. They keep looking for another way. What a neat philosophy. Never quit looking for a way to get where you're supposed to go. 2. Ants think winter all summer. That's an important philosophy. You can't be so naive as to think summer all summer. You say, well, isn't it nice? You can't think nice when it's nice. We will call you naive. You've got to think rock. You can't think sand and sun. 3. Ants think summer all winter. That's so important. I'm sure all winter long and say, this won't last long. We'll soon be out of here. What a neat philosophy. This won't last long. We'll soon be out of here. First warm day, the ants are out. First warm day, they're out. They can't wait to get out. What a neat philosophy. Can't wait to get at it. We teach in leadership skills. Average people look forward to getting off. Successful people look forward to getting on with it. The guy doesn't want off. He wants on. And that's what starts to transform his life into the doing, into the activity. Now here's the last of the ant philosophy. How much will an ant gather during the summer to prepare for the winter? Answer. All he possibly can. What an incredible philosophy. A group of psychiatrists invited me to come and lecture in Los Angeles. I never graduated from college, but they wanted to hear my story. So I go talk to the psychiatrists. Then in the middle of my talk, I had the audacity to say, Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you what I think most messes with the mind. They said, I think it is simply doing less than you can messes with the mind. It causes all kinds of psychic damage. I think simply being less than you can be, doing less than you could do, trying less than you could try, doing it with less enthusiasm than you could. I think it somehow damages the mind. It damages our self-image. Because here's what I've discovered happens. The minute you turn this around and start extending yourself, it isn't the value you get from extending yourself, that's the greatest value. It's how you feel about yourself, that's the greatest value. Because see, it's not what we get that makes us valuable, it's what we become. And part of becoming is to see what all you can become, see what all you can do, see how much you can earn, how much you can share, how much you can start, how far you can reach, how far you can extend your influence. If you're going to play the great drama game of life, the key is to keep measuring progress, to see how you're doing. How's your health doing? How's your income doing? How are your investments doing? If you're building a house, how is it coming along? What's going on? Measuring progress. That's what we call the name of the game. Here's how we teach it to our children. You must make measurable progress in reasonable time. We must be reasonable with time. You can't say to someone every five minutes, How are you doing now? Five minutes later, how are you doing now? This guy says, I haven't left the building yet. Give me a break. So, five minutes to ask for an account or a measure is too soon. Five years is too long, too late. Too many things can go wrong. The old prophet said, If you're angry, try to solve it before the sun goes down. Don't carry it over for another day. Tomorrow it might be too heavy to carry. A conversation a father should have with his daughter today. Because the magic is there. If you wait till tomorrow, the magic could be gone. Success is a numbers game. How many years do you want your child to spend in fourth grade? About what? One year. Progress. One grade. One year. And you've got to measure it. Dow. 
The name of the game is Measurable Progress in Reasonable Time. Now here's the next one. It's just as important. The Fruits of Labor. The guy comes home and says, Guess what happened today? I got a bushel of apples. And his neighbor says, Wow, a bushel of apples. How many oranges did you have to give up to get the bushel of apples? And the answer is, Of course nothing. You don't have to give up oranges to get apples. Here's what you give up. You give up picking up sticks. That's what you give up. But to get the bushel of apples, you've got to give up picking up sticks. So when the value arrives, it comes because of the effort. Here's the principle we learn. The fruits of labor are always sweeter than the gifts of fortune. That's a great principle to learn. The fruits of labor are always sweeter than the gifts of fortune. If you get rich without labor, that's called a gift, and it's always good, but you won't appreciate it. If you have to struggle, it's always better. The other thing you learn is that labor leads to fortune, and fortune leads to leisure. Leisure, now that's interesting. But we've got to put it in the right sequence. Labor, then fortune, then leisure. If you get those out of sequence, you'll become labor impaired. You'll become so poor you can't afford anything. Labor, fortune, then leisure. Here's another one. Labor precedes the prize. If you want the prize, the blue ribbon, the first prize, you've got to put in the labor. You've got to put in the time. So, it's labor, then prize. Now, it's the second of two things to remember when you're going after your piece of the American dream. Labor, and the joy of labor. Here's what the old book says. All labor that uplifts humanity has dignity and importance, and should be undertaken with painstaking excellence. Isn't that good advice? I love that. Labor with painstaking excellence. Wow, what a difference that'll make in your fortune, your future, your income, everything, your whole life. So, the fruits of labor. Labor always precedes the reward, and then the reward always exceeds the effort. I know people who say, well, if I've got to put in that much time, I ain't doing it. Well, here's what you've got to remember. That's the best deal going. Always will be the best deal going. Labor, then reward. And the reward is always far greater than the labor. I finally figured that out. And I'm telling you, it's made me wealthy. It's made me healthy. It's made me rich in spirit and emotions. Then here's what I finally figured out. The joy of labor. It isn't the major purpose of labor to get the money. Labor is one of the greatest opportunities and challenges of life. And when you labor with painstaking excellence, you will find the joy in labor, the joy of contributing to the world, the joy of making somebody else's life a little better because you lived. That's the joy of labor. So, here are the five major pieces of the life puzzle. Philosophy, attitude, lifestyle, activity, and the fruits of labor. Take a few moments to jot down the five key ideas, and when we come back, we'll talk about the second major subject of the seminar, the network of personal development. Make a promise to yourself. You'll read something educational every day. You'll read at least one book a month. You'll start working on your own personal philosophy. You'll start taking action on your dreams. Make a promise to yourself that you'll start making progress every day. That you'll make measurable progress in reasonable time. That you'll develop a lifestyle that you can be proud of. Make a promise to yourself that you'll work on your attitude. That you'll develop a good positive attitude. That you'll be an example for others to follow. That you'll develop the attitude that says, I'm not going to wait for somebody else to change my life. I'm going to take charge of it myself. Make a promise to yourself that you'll be an example for others to follow. That you'll develop a network of personal development. So, if success is the steady progress toward your own personal goals, then what is failure? Is failure working on a project that ended with poor results? No, of course not. Is failure launching a new product that failed miserably in the marketplace? No, of course not. Is failure doing the best you possibly can with your kids and having them disappoint you in a very personal way? No, of course not. There's no failure in pouring your heart, soil, and energy into something that didn't work. Rather, failure is not trying at all. If success is the steady progress toward your own personal goals, then failure is no progress at all, none, not even trying. Success and failure are always linked together. Success and failure are always linked to ambition. And let's remember, success is doing, failure is not doing. It's that simple. Tom Peters, world-renowned author and management expert, recently said, There is only one way to be in serious trouble today, 
then that is not to be trying, not to be failing, not to be stretching yourself. Success is a doing. You've got to actually do it. Activity is a high priority in the life process. To try and get maximum benefit out of what we have available, our resources, our skills, our knowledge, and our talents. Success is doing that tries to get maximum benefit out of what we have available. Benjamin Disraeli, former Prime Minister of England once said, Nothing can resist a human will that will stake even its existence on its purpose. I'll do it or die. What powerful words. We've already talked about resolve, doing it until. But here's what else resolve says. I will. Two of the most powerful words in our language. The formula for disaster could be should don't. Here's the formula for success. Could, should, will. I will. I should. I can. And I will. Two of the most powerful words in the language. I will. The man says, I will climb the mountain. They say, it's too high. It's too difficult. It's too rocky. It's never been done before. The man says, hey, it's my mountain. I'll climb it. Pretty soon, you'll see me waving from the top or dead on the side because I'm not coming back until I've done it. Powerful. There are several studies that show the greatest achievers aren't those who fail the least. No, the greatest achievers are those least frightened of failure. They're willing to take on the challenge without the guarantee of success, seeing the end but not sure when it will be or where it will be. Although success and failure go hand in hand, many people have a problem with failure. They think it's a bad word, has a bad connotation. They don't see it as a stepping stone. They see it as an end result. Quite often success requires failure sometimes many failures. In every scientific discovery, there were dozens or hundreds of failures before one success. Without failure, opportunity cannot be created. Without failure, there can be no success. But what is the measure of success? How do you know if you're truly successful? How do you know, especially when your success could be so vastly different from someone else's? Here's how you measure results. Making measurable progress in a reasonable time. That's all life asks. Making measurable progress in reasonable time. So, you've got to be reasonable with time. Don't be unreasonable with time. Parents, don't be unreasonable with time. Managers, brokers, business associates, have a little patience. You can't ask somebody every five minutes, how are you doing now? That's too soon. The guy says, I haven't left the building yet, give me a break. So, five minutes is too soon to ask. So, Five years is what? Too long? And too late? So, what is reasonable time to ask for results as a measure of progress? Here's number one. At the end of the day, you can't let more than a day go by without getting some things done. Some letters written, having a conversation with your son or daughter. You can't postpone the important more than a day. When you work on the job, there are some things you've got to get done within a day. You've got to make some calls within a day. Your health disciplines, You've got to get those done within a day. You can't carry over. You can't say, well, I'll eat nine apples ten days from now. No, it's an apple a day, a day. Some things you've got to get done within a day. So, at five minutes to midnight and you haven't gotten your apple in yet, munch away and get it done, a day. Here's what's next. A week. Some things you've got to get done within a week. Stuff on the job, calls made, activities. A week is a good chunk of time. Can't let more than a week go by without taking a look and a measure to see how you're doing. Second, in the last 90 days, how many books have you read to invest in the miracle of your mind, to give you ideas to ponder, to fashion your future with meticulous care? How many books have you read in the last 90 days? Third question, in the last six months, how many classes have you taken to improve your skills or to develop new skills for your future and your family? How many classes in the last six months? I'm telling you, numbers tell us everything. Success is a numbers game. You've got to make progress. You've got to make progress in reasonable time. You've got to take a look at the numbers and see how you're doing. It's the name of the game. How often should you weigh the new baby? Well, you say, I'll weigh the new baby next spring. No, you can't wait until next spring. Don't you have to weigh the new baby often? And the answer is yes, of course to see whether it's gaining weight or it's losing weight. What if it's losing weight? The alarm bells have got to go off. You can't let a little baby lose weight very long. It's called disaster. These numbers are important. 
How often should you check the corporation to see if it's healthy or not? You say, well, in a couple of years, we'll get all the accounts together. No, you'll be out of business. In Las Vegas, the big gambling houses, guess how often they put together a financial statement to see where they are? Several times a day. Why? So much is happening. If you don't learn when to shut down some of those tables, you'll be out of business by midnight. You can't wait till midnight. You can't wait till tomorrow. Tomorrow's too late. You've got to know the numbers. What is your cholesterol count? You don't know, and you don't care. You've just got your fingers crossed for the future. We'd better come and get your family and take them to safety. Come on. Be responsible for the set of your own sale. Leave it to no one else but yourself, and learn to refine these numbers for yourself. Now what if your results are not that good right now? What if you're going through some tough times and aren't quite sure what to do next? You know why I do seminars and lectures and write books and audio programs? So I can attend them all myself, read it again myself, listen again myself. I don't do it just to hear myself talk, and I don't do it for the money. I do it because the teacher always receives the greatest lessons. He seeks to teach others. What's the best way out of a blue mood? Talk somebody else through theirs. What's the best way out of a mental energy slump? Talk somebody else through theirs. What's the best way to start solving your own problems? Talk to somebody else about theirs. Why? Because when you start talking someone else through their blue mood or their mental slump or their problem, you'll hear yourself say amazing things. You'll hear all the knowledge that you've gathered come out to help this other person, and it will ultimately help you by hearing it again. It just works that way. It's often easier to tap our resources for somebody else than it is to tap them for ourselves. Sometimes defeat is the best beginning. Why? Well, for one, if you're at the very bottom, there's only one way to go. Up. But more importantly, if you're flat on your back, mentally and financially, you'll usually become sufficiently disgusted to reach way down deep inside yourself and pull out miracles, pull out talents, and pull out abilities, and pull out desires and determination. When you're flat broke or flat miserable, you'll eventually become so disgusted that you'll pull out the basic essentials required to make everything better. And it's in the face of adversity that things begin to change. That you begin to change. With enough disgust, desire and determination to change your life, you'll start saying, I've had it, and of this no more, never again. Here's where the miracle begins. I've had it, enough, no more, never again. These words and these thoughts really rattle the power of time and fate and circumstances. And these three things, time and fate and circumstances, all get together and say, Okay, okay, we can see that we have no power here. We're facing some major resolve. This guy's not going to give up. He's had it. He's done with all this nonsense. We better step aside and let this guy get by. Resolve. Inspiration through disgust. But a lot of people don't change themselves. They wait for circumstances to change, the government to change, life to change. What'll that do? Not much. These poor unfortunate folks accept their defeats and wallow in their self-pity. Why? Because they refuse to take control of the situation. They refuse to take control of their life, their career, their health, their relationships, their finances. They refuse to take control and take responsibility and get sufficiently disgusted to change it. But if you are disgusted, if you are making changes, if this program finds you in the middle of your own personal slump, then I have some words to offer you. Your present failure is a temporary condition. It is only a temporary condition. You will rebound from failure just as surely as you gravitated into failure. Somebody once suggested to me in about a failure that I should tell myself, this too shall pass. I firmly believe that you're only given as much as you can handle, as much negativity, as much failure, as much disappointment. This too shall pass if you grasp for a new beginning, if you pull yourself up and move back into the world with a plan. So, as foolish as it might sound, be thankful for your current limitations or failures, for they are building blocks from which to create greatness. You can go where you want to go. You can do what you want to do. You can become what you want to become. You can do it all, starting now, starting right where you are. So, be grateful for adversity, but for your future. Make it work for you, not against you. Make your failures give birth to great opportunity, not prolonged agony. Make your disgust lead to inspiration, not depression. The world will willingly sit by and let you wallow in your sorrows until you die, broke, and alone. 
then here's what else the world will do. The world will step aside and let you by, once you decide that your present situation is only temporary, once you decide to get back on your feet and make your mark. The world doesn't care which choice you make, to stop here, here, or to go on. The world doesn't really care. So, you have to. You have to care in your own enlightened self-interest. Give a run at adventure. Keep your eyes firmly on the achievement, on your ambition, and not merely existence and self-pity. Make a commitment to excellence. Success is something you attract by the person you become. Success is not something you pursue. What you pursue usually eludes you like a butterfly, something you go after that you can't catch. Success is something you attract. Act like a magnet by the person you become. To attract attractive people, we've talked about this before. To attract attractive people, you must be attractive. To attract powerful people, you must be powerful. To attract committed people, you must be committed. Instead of going to work on them, you go to work on yourself. You work harder on yourself than you work on the job. And if you become, you can attract. The whole key is to make yourself valuable. The key is to make yourself attractive. The key is to make yourself skilled, skillful, competent, willing, powerful, unique, sophisticated, cultured, being able to manage and control, healthy. The whole key really to the future is personal development. Because the greatest gift you can give to someone else is your personal development, self-development, self-investment. The greatest gift you can give is your own personal development. If I become 10 times wiser, 10 times stronger, 10 times brighter, 10 times more competent, think of what that will do for my success. If I grow, think of what that will do for my future. Self-development earns success. Self-investment earns respect. And the only way to make a better and better investment in your future is to become better, stronger, wiser, and more competent. The more attractive you become, the more attractive you are. And the more attractive you are, the more you attract success. Self-development, self-investment attract success. That's powerful. Now here's what would be pitiful if your income grew and you didn't grow. Because here's what usually happens. If your income takes some jumps, it's best that you grow quickly up to where your income is. Why? Because otherwise, your income will soon come back to where you are. Somebody once said, if someone hands you a million pounds, it's best you become a millionaire, so you get to keep the money. I'm telling you, success doesn't want to hang around an incompetent person. That's the problem with winning the lottery. The lack of self-development to be able to master it and keep it. And now, the fortune is bigger than the person rather than the person being bigger than the fortune. If you're a parent, use that as a challenge to grow personally. Use the challenge of parenting to grow. See what you can become. One ancient writer said this. Here are some reassuring words. God's arm is not short. Aren't those reassuring words? God's arm is not short. You can't think of anything more pitiful than a God with a short arm. Poor God, his arms are too short. He can't reach all the way can't reach out to all of us. This writer said, No, be reassured. God's arm is not short. He can reach all the way, and he can reach everybody. Didn't that be said of every father, of every mother? They can reach all of their children. They can reach all the way. They don't lack stories and illustrations. They don't lack wisdom and power. And the only way you can become that kind of parent, the only way you can keep up that process, is by personal development, by becoming better than you are, stronger than you are, wiser than you are, becoming, growing so that your investment grows as your children grow. You grow, your power grows, your influence grows, your wisdom grows, your command of the language grows. You see that's what's challenging, to be involved in a situation that makes you grow. If that situation is success, keep growing to be bigger than your fortune. If that situation is failure, Keep growing until you're bigger than the problem. Keep growing, keep becoming, keep doing it until... Now there are two qualities that can increase your chances of success. Two very important qualities. Number one, patience. Number two, persistence. Let's talk about patience for a moment. Patience is what? Learning to handle the passing of time. Now once you've had an appetite for success and you start going for it, now you've got to learn to handle the passing of time. Here's why. It takes time. It takes time to build a corporate work of art. 
It takes time to build a symphony orchestra with flawless music and harmony that sends you on flights of ecstasy, to be remembered long after the orchestra has shut down and the lights have gone out. It takes time to put harmony together. It takes time to build a life. It takes time to build an enterprise. It takes time to get through school. It takes time to develop and grow. So, give your enterprise time, give your business time. If you're in management, give your people time. If you're a parent, give your kids time. Don't be too short, too quick. Give them time. Now, not forever, but time. It takes time. Here's the ultimate challenge. You've got to have patience with yourself. It takes time to make changes in habit and discipline. It takes time to correct old errors in judgment and to finally give up old blame and pick up new responsibility. I'm telling you, it took me some time. I used to blame the government and blame taxes and blame the company and blame the marketplace. It took me a long time to give that up. That was a pretty comfortable list to explain my empty bank account, pennies in my pocket, nothing in the bank, not doing well, embarrassed by my situation. It took time. That took a while. So, have patience with yourself. Number one. And number two, while you're dealing with the passing of time, number two is to keep doing it. Be persistent. Be tenacious. Keep doing it until, as long as you are patient and persistent, it's hard to elude success. As long as you maintain patience and persistence, tenacity, there's only one person, just one person, that will draw the line between success and failure. You. So, be patient. Be persistent. You need both patience and persistence together. And here's why. Lack of patience is probably the worst enemy of ambition. While your ambition keeps growing, keeps moving, keeps looking for new ways to succeed, impatience tends to grow frustrated. Impatience won't allow for persistence. Impatience wants to give up. Impatience calls discouragement failure. But your ambition won't let you give up so easily. Not if you're persistent. What others may call failure, ambition calls a learning opportunity. A chance to make adjustments along the charted course to success. Ambition knows something else too. Ambition knows that the longer the achievement is incoming, the more valued it is. So, let me give you a few aspects of patience. Some examples that might help illustrate just how valuable it is. There are six aspects of patience. And here's number one. Knowing when an opportunity is right and when more preparation is needed. Let's say you're opening up a restaurant specializing in fresh seafood. You're all excited to get going, get the money coming in instead of it all going out. You're all excited. So, because you're all excited, you want to open early. Your impatience gets the best of you, and so you do open before your scheduled grand opening. Customers start coming in. They're all excited about this new great restaurant, and everybody wants some fresh seafood. They're all ordering fresh seafood from the menu. But now you panic. You haven't got any. You're not ready. The fresh seafood shipment won't come in for a week. Impatience has just killed the restaurant. Now let's say you've got a great new product that's scheduled to come out on the market in the next several months. Everything's going according to plan. So you start planning your ads, start planning big public relations events. You're so sure that it's going to happen that you set a date. The engineers told you that the product's not ready, but you're sure it will be. You start planning everything, invite lots of people, influential people, buyers of your product. You're so excited that you went ahead without the product actually being done. Come the week of the grand unveiling, the engineers come to you and say it still doesn't work. Your impatience just lost you credibility in the marketplace. That's number one. Be patient in knowing the difference between when the opportunity is right and when more work needs to be done. Here's number two. Remain alert, even if opportunity doesn't come right away. Make sure that your patience allows you to keep your eyes open and ready for opportunity. Keep looking. Be patient. Number three. Keep preparing for opportunities even if there's a delay. Even if things aren't going just the way you think they should. Keep your disappointments at bay and keep getting ready for opportunities. Be prepared. Always be prepared. Don't let impatience allow you to give up. Number four. Take the little setbacks in stride. Take the little successes in stride. Don't let small disappointments discourage you. Don't let the little successes delude you. Avoid the emotional roller coaster that will always disrupt your plan. Number five. If you're waiting on the decisions of others, be patient. You cannot control the decision making abilities of others. You cannot control their timing. If your project was to come up before the board in one meeting and time ran out, 
and they moved your project to the top of the agenda for the next meeting. Be patient. Don't be frustrated about what you have no control over. And number six, take a vacation from your ambition. If you've been working day after day, week after week, month after month without a break, take a vacation from your ambition. The patient person, secure in their ambition, knows that the drive and ambition will still be there even after some time off. As a matter of fact, with some time off, the ambition will have a stronger pull than ever when you come back to it. Persistence is patience in action. Persistence is creative, always looking for new opportunities. Persistence is courageous. It doesn't give in to fear. Persistence is hopeful. It doesn't let discouragement through the door. Persistence is positive. It keeps you on track with your plans and your goals. And the last thing that persistence is, is cheerful, not gloomy. Cheerful persistence knows that gloom and depression and disappointments waste energy. Cheerfulness creates it. Patience and persistence are both required for success. And as we end this side, please remember that success and failure are also intricately intertwined. For without failure, you can never appreciate success. Quite often, without failure, there will never be success.